Welcome everyone to this latest colloquium of the Institute for Ethics in AI at Oxford. My name is John Tosulis and I'm the director of the Institute. It's our great good fortune today to be discussing Simon Chesterman's important book, We the Robots, Regulating Artificial Intelligence and the Limits of Law, which was published by Cambridge University Press last year. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Simon as our main speaker. He's come here by means of a heroic 14-hour journey from Singapore, arriving earlier today. So Simon is Dean and Provost's Chair, Professor of the National University of Singapore, Faculty of Law, and Senior Director of AI Governance at AI Singapore. He's also editor of the Asian Journal of International Law, the author of four novels, and of numerous academic works, including One Nation Under Surveillance, OUP 2011, You the People, OUP 2004, and Just War or Just Peace, OUP 2001. Simon begins by noting in this book that developments in AI technology pose thorny problems of regulation, and this is largely down to three general features that these developments possess. One is the dizzying speed at which they take place. Second is the capacity for autonomous operation displayed by these technologies. And the third is the opacity of the operations of a lot of AI technology, not just to lay people, but even to their own creators. And Simon surveys a number of regulatory challenges in this book that are posed by AI technologies, including issues of attributing responsibility, issues of legal personality, and of transparency and explainability, before coming to the reassuring conclusion, reassuring for all law students, that existing state institutions and norms are capable of regulating most applications of AI. So Simon is not an AI madman who thinks we need to totally transform law and society to accommodate AI. Existing structures enable us to handle most of the problems. But it would be a mistake to regard this book as a conservative defense, merely a conservative defense of existing law's capacity to handle pretty much anything that AI can throw at, at it. It also makes a number of intriguing original proposals, and I just wanted to highlight two. One is that it offers a tripartite scheme for the regulation of AI, whereby problems are divided into the following three areas. Those that can be dealt with as matters of practicality. And practicality for Simon seems to be dealing with these issues through a utilitarian cost-benefit analysis. And his key example here is the regulation of autonomous vehicles. Second, there are matters to be dealt with on the plane of what Simon calls morality, since they require actual human actors to be held accountable. And one example is command responsibility in war. And then there's a third level or third domain of regulation, matters that fall within this intriguing area that Simon calls legitimacy. And this is the idea, um, which I find very intriguing, that there are certain governmental or public functions that of their very nature cannot be outsourced to automated systems, that it's not enough simply to have a human who will be held accountable, but actually a human must make these decisions. So that's a very intriguing tripartite regulatory framework. A second kind of proposal concerns the transnational governance of artificial intelligence. Um, we were just talking a little bit earlier about the AI Act produced by the EU. Simon comes to the rather, again, conservative conclusion that, quote, comprehensive global regulation of AI generally is unrealistic and probably undesirable. So I suspect that might mean he's a bit of a skeptic about something like the AI Act produced by the EU. Instead of comprehensive regulation, Simon believes that the focus should be on establishing global norms that set out certain minimalist red lines, protecting basic norms and preventing certain kinds of transboundary threats. So that's just some of the interesting and um, engaging um, ideas that Simon articulates in this book. In order to comment on these ideas, we're very fortunate to have two um, real experts in this area. First commentator is Helen Mountfield QC, who is principal of Mansfield College and a barrister at the illustrious Matrix Chambers, where she specializes in constitutional human rights and equality law. And she is also currently a trustee of the Institute for the Future of Work. 
And our second commentator is John Zerilli, who is a Leverhulme Fellow at Oxford's Law Faculty and a research associate in the Institute for Ethics and AI, also happens to be the third Australian sitting at this table, both a lawyer and a philosopher. Um, he's the author of numerous publications, despite um, his um, young age, including A Citizen's Guide to Artificial Intelligence, which was published by MIT in 2021. Obviously a fantastic year for books on AI. So once Simon is given his um, presentation, we're then gonna have the commentators respond. Simon will get a chance to respond to their responses, and then we will throw it open to general discussion with the audience that's present here and the audience that's um, on YouTube, watching us on YouTube. And those who are watching us on YouTube, please use the chat function to ask your questions, and I will do my best to convey as many of them as I can. But having said all that, Simon, over to you. Thank you so much, John. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's um, much as I'm delighted to have a YouTube audience, it's really nice to have people here in person, and I'm looking forward to a robust exchange of views. John, thank you for that uh, extremely generous um, introduction and, and survey of uh, what I've been trying to do in the book. Helen and John, thank you for agreeing to be here. I look forward to your comments as well. So what I'll do in 20 to absolute maximum 30 minutes is uh, introduce some of the ideas in the book really as a provocation to conversation. Uh, and uh, I start this with the background that I come at this topic not as a technical expert, uh, I'm not a computer science expert, but I realized in the course of uh, working out why I was so interested in this topic that I've always been interested in crises in public authority. So almost exactly 25 years ago, I arrived at Oxford ready to do a doctorate uh, with the late Ian Brownlee. Uh, one of, I was one of his last doctoral students, and I was originally gonna do something on theories of international criminal law, uh, which was at the time when the Rome Statute was being uh, drafted. And he said, oh, no, no, no I'm not gonna supervise that. Come up, come up with a few new topics. Uh, and eventually I settled on humanitarian intervention, sort of whether and how external actors could intervene when a state turns on itself. My next project, which was the You the People book, was transnational administration or transitional administration, whether external actors can rebuild a state. Then I looked at national security, the one nation under surveillance, uh, which is how states should react to threats from within and without from terrorism. Uh, and then as I became more interested in data protection, privacy, and the emerging role of artificial intelligence, I realized that technology actually poses potential threats to the state. Uh, in terms of its ability to maintain order, in, in its ability to regulate a functioning economy uh, and to protect certain social values. Uh, and that was really the impetus, along with getting to know some computer scientists who said, actually, it would be kind of helpful to have some regulation. Uh, and I think one of the striking things in the debates about regulation is that much as there has been a lot of talk from the top down and the AI Act we might talk about in conversation, there's also a growing realisation on the part of companies invested in this area that they have an interest in some kind of regulation as well. But what kind of regulation is necessary? Um, so let me just throw up a couple of slides to, uh, to be a little bit more lively than just my own face talking. Um, I like this slide because it's, um, it's from 1956, so it's, it's triply relevant. It's relevant because this is the conference, or the workshop rather, at Dartmouth College where artificial intelligence is widely attributed to have been coined. Um, but it's also interesting for two other reasons. One uh, is uh, the, the complete lack of diversity. Uh, it's a bunch of white guys uh, who thought that they could, could do this, solve the problems of AI. Uh, and indeed, that's, that's the other thing, that they were incredibly ambitious, ridiculously ambitious. They got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to have this two-month workshop on the basis, they said, that in two months, we think we can probably work out most of AI. Uh, and a couple of generations later, we're still grappling with that. So that's 1956. Jump forward a decade, uh, or 12 years, 1968, you've got 2001. The iconic um, Arthur C. Clarke, Stanley Kubrick collaboration, uh, which really epitomizes for many the fears of AI, uh, that uh, there could be a situation in which a machine puts its own priorities, its own values ahead of humans, uh, in that case uh, of the human crew on board this spaceship. Uh, but as John said, I'm not a crazy anti-AI advocate. Uh, although there are people who are quite apocalyptic in their language. And what, again, is really interesting uh, is that these are not technophobes. Uh, these are not neo-Luddites. We've got people like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, um, Stephen Hawking, um, warning about possibly ap apocalyptic 
concerns about artificial intelligence. So what are those concerns? Why should regulators care? Um, I emphasize that I'm really talking for the most part about narrow artificial intelligence rather than general AI. Questions of superintelligence we will talk about in the margins. Uh, and I've had an article that was rejected from a, a law journal because <laughs> it said this is so far in the realm of science fiction uh, as not to be worth talking about. But that's an article on legal, personal, legal personality of AI, which did end up getting published and, uh, and is actually, I think, a really interesting topic. Not one that we need to address at the moment. I don't think it makes sense to give AI personality at the moment, but certainly it's something we should be thinking about and talking about. So what are the regulatory challenges? And John's already highlighted this. Um, but much as I say that um, most of the law can deal with most technical problems and most of the artificial intelligence challenges most of the time, uh, there are challenges. Uh, and the first is speed. Uh, and this is not new. It is not unique to artificial intelligence. Much of technology does things faster than humans can. Uh, and a simple illustration of this is the, the flash crash of 12 years ago, when in the space of half an hour, a trillion dollars was wiped off the New York Stock Exchange in half an hour, and no one knew why. Uh, and a big part of that uh, was uh, high-frequency trading algorithms. So these are algorithms that were trading um, backwards and forwards faster than human could. And so in theory, securities regulation applied to these automated transactions the same way it would if John and I were engaging in trades. But if John and I are engaging in trades, we might be able to do maybe a couple of minutes, but these were doing tens of thousands of trades a second, which is how things spiraled out of control. Uh, and then spiraled back into control, and again, no one knew for months exactly what had happened. So that's one challenge. Again, not unique to artificial intelligence, uh, but a problem that technology poses generally. The second is autonomy. Uh, and uh, probably the easiest example to show here is the autonomous vehicle. Uh, if an autonomous vehicle crashes into someone, there's no driver, who's to blame? Um, this is often overstated, I think, in terms of the complexity. Much of, much of this can be dealt with, as I'll say later, through product liability. Uh, but it does pose challenges if we need to attribute um, the, an alleged wrong to a wrongdoer. Uh, and indeed, most of the rule of law really is premised on an anthropocentric, on a human-centric notion uh, that the rule of law is about the rights of humans and the responsibilities of humans, or our entities, like legal corporations. Uh, and so this is why I think autonomy of machines leads some people to say, well, therefore, we need new personality for artificial intelligence. So we've got someone to blame. Uh, and in the book, I talk about how there's an interesting analogy here with the idea of medieval trials of animals, where in the past, if there was either a plague or if an animal killed a child, uh, there was a real desire to hold someone to account, uh, because if you don't, then the wrong goes unpunished uh, and there is a perceived injustice. Uh, I think we're not yet at the stage where we're going to see a, a pig dressed up in the equivalent of, uh, of an, an autonomous vehicle or an AI system being dressed up. But I think it's an interesting question why we want to hold AI responsible uh, and what challenges autonomy poses. So that's the second challenge, that there are decisions being taken by autonomous systems that aren't easily attributable to humans or to corporations. Uh, not easily, but for the most part, they can be attributed. Third, and probably the, a bigger challenge that is more unique to AI and really only in the last decade is opacity. Uh, and this is the quality of being hard to understand. Uh, this is uh, not entirely new. We've long had different types of opacity. There are all sorts of areas in which there are trade secrets. Uh, there are complex problems that are hard to understand. AI is a little bit different in that machine learning techniques, in particular those developed over the last decade, can be literally impossible for a human to understand, even an expert. Uh, and this poses a challenge because one of the reasons why AI systems are very good at optimization is their ability to manipulate thousands, millions of variables. Uh, and so if you want to reduce it to a level that a human can understand, you might be doing that at the cost of quality. Uh, and so this is why I say in the book that transparency is important, but transparency should often be regarded as a cost. Uh, and, uh, and in some situations, that's a cost worth paying. In others, it's not. There are all sorts of areas of life where you don't actually understand at a deep level what's going on, and that's not always a problem. In the medical field, for example, there are all sorts of pharmaceuticals where if a randomized control trial uh, can establish that it achieves a certain amount of benefit with, a, with a, an acceptable level of harm, we will roll those treatments out, even, at, even if at a molecular level we don't understand what's going on. Uh, the situation is even more extreme in psychology and psychiatry, where there are all sorts of treatments where we really do not understand why they work. Even controversial 
treatments like electroconvulsive therapy can be useful in treating some forms of depression. Uh, we don't know why it works, uh, but we're satisfied with the results. So in some situations like that, provided we go through this kind of utilitarian calculus, uh, then, uh, then we might accept it, but not always. Uh, and that's something I'll come back to also. So these are the challenges. What's the solution? Well, unfortunately, for the better part of the 20th century, we were stuck with this guy. Uh, this is Isaac Asimov, uh, a great science fiction writer, not a great legislator, uh, but famous in this field for his three laws of robotics, uh, which can, were written in a story in 1942. Uh, and the thing that people forget uh, is that Asimov was a great writer and his laws of robotics are so interesting because they didn't work. If they had worked, if they'd solved the problems of AI, his literary career would have been brief. Indeed, the very first story that he wrote about it wrote about these in and run around in 1942 was about how a robot became paralyzed by a contradiction between the second and third laws resolved only when a human threw himself into harm's way to invoke the first. Uh, and yet for the better part of the 20th century, uh, people would often default either to Asimov or to similar ideas that if only we could work out what the rules should be for AI, we'd solve the problems. Now, this really took off uh, in around 2016. Uh, and beginning in 2016, uh, there was a proliferation of rules. Uh, Singapore's there somewhere. Uh, there were individual countries, uh, corporations, consortium of corporations, groups of NGOs, groups of specialists coming up with their lists of ethics principles. Why in this period? What, what happened around 2016 and in particular up to 2018? Because it was in 2018 that Microsoft, Facebook, Google, uh, and, and a bunch of others adopted their rules. Well, it was partly 2016 to 2018 uh, is when we saw the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the election of Donald Trump. And it was in 2018 that the widespread uh, publication of, uh, of what had happened with Cambridge Analytica became famous. And so people began to realize that the problems associated with this new technology were not limited to identity theft or to um, being recommended strange things or even to the possibility of bias, as important as biased algorithms are, uh, but they could actually transform world history, uh, that they could change the results of an election in the most powerful country on the planet. So I think people at that point began to realize that, that there is a problem. Uh, and so we saw this proliferation of rules, uh, again, focused, however, on this idea that if only we came up with, we came up with a list of rules, uh, then this would solve the problem. So what are these rules? Well, basically, if you survey all of these principles, you end up with overlapping sets of rules. It's not completely identical, but broadly there are six pretty common themes. Uh, and they're all uncontroversial. Human control, transparency, AI should be safe, it should be accountable, it shouldn't discriminate, respect privacy. Hard to disagree with any of this. But the question I would ask is, to what extent is any of this necessary? Safety, saying AI should be safe is a bit like saying, well, product liability rules should apply. Accountability, well, you shouldn't be able to do through an AI system what you can't do yourself. And if an AI system either breaks the criminal law or injures someone, uh, then someone should be accountable. Uh, and it shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't be able to outsource, as John was saying, that kind of accountability. Non-discrimination, yes, human rights should apply. Privacy, data protection laws should apply. There is an argument that human control and transparency are a little bit different. Uh, and this, these points to the, the red lines that I do uh, suggest we should be thinking about. Uh, that there should be some kind of restriction on developing autonomous systems that operate beyond human control. Uh, and even I think the US military has accepted that an autonomous weapon without a kill switch is probably a bad idea. Uh, and so that basic level of human control, um, I essentially argue that you should always be able to attribute um, uh, AI activity back to either a human or a corporate actor. And transparency, that accountability is only possible if we understand in appropriate circumstances, how decisions were made. That doesn't mean we need to understand everything, but it does mean that we need to have sufficient information in the right circumstances to hold traditional legal persons, humans or corporations or governments accountable. So rather than focusing on the what question, like what the rules should be, I think it's helpful to take a step back and think, well, why are we doing this in the first place? Why are we engaged in this conversation? Why do we want to regulate and importantly, why might we not want to regulate? And maybe this is a conversation we have a little bit more openly in Singapore uh, because of the very pragmatic approach of the government, but I think it's an interesting question to pursue. First on the issue of why regulate, we regulate in general for two broad reasons. First is to address market failures. 
Uh, in the case of autonomous vehicles, for example, you could imagine a scenario in which pedestrians are liable for their own injuries if they get hit by autonomous vehicles. But I think most of us would accept that that's a pretty unfair and probably an inefficient way to regulate that area. Uh, and indeed, the history of product liability through the 20th century essentially is the realization that buyer beware is a very inefficient means of regulating potentially harmful activity. Much better to put the onus on the manufacturer uh, to uh, develop their products in a manner that is safe and hold them accountable if they're not, outside of some exceptions. So that's one reason we want to regulate, to address market failures. Secondly, however, we often regulate in support of social or other policies. So even if it were efficient to discriminate on the basis of race, sex, sexual orientation, ethnicity, anything else, uh, we wouldn't, or at least most jurisdictions, would refrain from doing that, not because of an efficiency argument, but because of a morality argument. Uh, and so even if, for example, it were more efficient to discriminate in sentencing on the basis of race or in counterterrorism activity on the basis of race, uh, most jurisdictions would say that's an unfair approach, not because, uh, well, you could debate whether it would actually lead to better outcomes, there's some evidence that it would not, but even if it could lead to a good outcome, you shouldn't do it because of these other social or other values that we want to uphold. Against this, there's actually the argument that maybe we want to hold back from uh, regulation completely. And this is an argument that we've had quite openly in Singapore, where there was a review of the penal code a few years back, which concluded that we did not want to regulate, uh, in a criminal sense, artificial intelligence, for fear it would drive innovation elsewhere. Uh, if you raise the cost in one small jurisdiction like Singapore, you, you might minimize a certain amount of harm in that jurisdiction, but you'll also drive companies elsewhere. Uh, and I think that is a, that's a legitimate concern. It shouldn't necessarily constrain you uh, but, uh, completely, but it's, it's something that I think needs to be confronted openly. Uh, if you raise those costs, you run the risk of losing competitive advantages. And what's been striking is this debate has played out in di very different ways in different jurisdictions. Uh, in the United States, although, as I'll point out at the very end, there is a, a change in the debate there, the US has no federal data protection law and no federal law regulating broadly artificial intelligence. Uh, it's very much a market-driven approach, uh, and one argument would go, that's one reason why American companies are so uh, important in this space, precisely because they're not regulated very heavily. Uh, indeed, Bill Gates used to joke uh, that uh, Microsoft in the early 2000s didn't even have an office in Washington. All he wanted from Washington uh, was to be left alone. Um, very different approach in the European Union, uh, where there is a, very much a rights focus, and we've seen this both in artificial intelligence and in data protection where even if it does raise costs, that's seen as a cost worth paying uh, because of the, the principles that it upholds, the rights it upholds. China, until recently, uh, I would have said, is in a very, third, a very separate third category, where China has approached this question through the lens of national sovereignty. Uh, China, back in 2017, outlined a national strategy for AI, which was very much investing in AI, trying to make China a, a data and AI leader, uh, really embracing the idea that to get ahead in AI, you need data, as the, as the line from Silicon Valley goes, whoever has the most data wins. Uh, and so China really had a no-holds-barred approach to collecting data, encouraging technology companies to, to pursue this. Uh, but really in the last 12 months, uh, and especially in the last six months, China has changed its tune. Uh, China has started to rein in technology companies. Uh, it has started to uh, promote certain values. Uh, now, this is not necessarily through a human rights lens. Often it's through protecting the interests of the state uh, or perhaps idiosyncratic, concern, idiosyncratic concerns about sort of children playing too much time, spending too much time playing video games, uh, but you've seen a much more interventionist approach. So China, I would still say, if you're setting out a kind of tripartite approach, the US is still the market, the Europeans are still the rights-based, China is still sovereignty-based, uh, but if you look at some of the recent Chinese draft laws and you didn't know they were from China, I actually have a colleague who plays a game, you take an excerpt from a law and Try to, get, try to get people to guess where this comes from. Uh, and some of the Chinese laws look a lot like the European Union's uh, principles, at least in the most recent iteration. Whether they will be enforced is a slightly different question. So these are the questions why regulate. Related to this, and in particular related to this question of whether you want to regulate or not, is when. Uh, and here the Collingridge Dilemma, I think, is a really interesting lens through which to view this. This is a 42-year-old book back in 1980, The Social Control of Technology by David Collingridge, uh, who pointed out uh, an interesting dilemma for the regulator. At an early stage of innovation, it's easy to regulate, but you don't know what to do. You don't know what the harms are. 
if you wait, it becomes clearer what the harms are, it becomes clearer what you should be worried about, uh, but the costs have gone up. So if you go back to 2004, there's this company called The Facebook. You probably could have regulated social media, but we wouldn't know what the problems were. Jump forward to today, it's a lot harder. Uh, and so there are other approaches. The precautionary principle is an idea borrowed from environmental law. This is the idea that you shouldn't wait for scientific certainty uh, in order to regulate. Uh, and in Singapore, there was a wonderful reference by the, the minister overseeing um, the smart nation, as it's called, uh, which was to quote, mastly inactivity, uh, which actually traced the origins of this, which was British policy in Afghanistan in the 19th century, where mastly inactivity meant that you, you don't intervene, but you remain in touch with all the parties. Uh, it ended in 19th century Afghanistan in humiliating defeat, which I don't think was the idea here, but, uh, but this is the idea that you you set up regulatory sandboxes, you stay in touch with uh, the companies, but you don't interfere unnecessarily. So, all right, once you've decided that you do perhaps want to regulate, how do you do it? Uh, and this is the tripartite approach that, uh, that uh, John so, so succinctly summed up, and I'll do it very briefly. The first is, I think, when we look at regulation, uh, rather than the supply side, that is the sort of Asimovian approach, let's just come up with the rules, I think we want to look very much at the, the reasons we're regulating and approach um, the management of risk in that lens, through that lens. Uh, and the three ways I divide this up is the first is utilitarian. Some things we just want to manage the risk, get the benefit, minimize the harm. And so autonomous vehicles, we just want them to be safe. Perhaps in the discussion we can talk about trolley problems if people are really enthusiastic, uh, but let's just set that aside for the moment. I think most people want autonomous vehicles to be safe rather than there being a moral question that a car has no driver, uh, we just want them to be safe. There are, however, some red lines, uh, and uh, lethal autonomous weapons I would hold out as one of them. Uh, at least the idea that uh, a, a human should be making life and death decisions in the battlefield. Not because he or she will make better decisions. Uh, I think the argument that the battlefield is too complex is a terrible argument, because autonomous systems are getting better and better at making these decisions. The reason a human should be making those decisions is so that a human has to grapple with them and then can be held accountable for them. Uh, and then the third is this idea of process legitimacy, which is the idea, perhaps epitomized by a judge, uh, most simply, uh, that there are some decisions that shouldn't only be made by just any old human, but some decisions should be made by a particular human. And the legitimacy of that decision comes not from the fact that he or she is human, but from the role he or she plays in some kind of politically accountable structure, such as a judge, or this idea that governments shouldn't be outsourcing um, decisions that essentially are public decisions, uh, the legitimacy of which comes from the process by which the people who make those decisions are chosen. Okay, I'm coming to the end. This is uh, just a, a couple of uh, illustrations from news items. Obviously, when the EU almost a year ago outlined the, the draft AI Act, uh, it was held up as um, uh, uh, sort of planting a flag, saying, right, we are going to establish some rules. Almost immediately, consultants were at work trying to work out how much this was going to cost, where it would drive innovation elsewhere. Uh, and on this question of global regulation, it is a real question whether the Europeans can have a kind of Brussels effect the way they have with, uh, with data protection in the area of AI. I suspect that's going to be difficult because AI is much more disaggregated than data protection, but again, we can talk about that in discussion. It hasn't stopped with Europe, of course. Uh, in my own country, my home country, my country of origin in Australia, uh, got in the news because it was one of the first countries to recognise that an AI can be an inventor. Now, the AI in this case did not get any rights, uh, but the recognition that AI can actually create for the purposes of patent law is a position that the Europeans, Americans, uh, and indeed the British Patent Office had rejected. Um, China, this is from last month, China's uh, efforts to regulate uh, becoming uh, more elaborate. Um, the United States has uh, resuscitated uh, the Algorithmic Accountability Act with um, debates going on there. Uh, and so all this to say that this is a moving target. The ink on the paper in the, of the book uh, is uh, barely dry, and already I'm being asked if I've got a second edition coming out soon. Uh, so as I, as I kind of quip at the end of the introduction, uh, a book like this can't possibly hope to answer all the questions associated with AI uh, that, uh, that are being asked at the moment. Uh, and indeed, Picasso has a memorable quote saying that computers are useless. All they can give you are answers. Uh, I, my hope, however, is that by reframing some of the debates, I'm at least helping to help us ask the right questions. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm really looking forward to a robust exchange of views. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, really impressive talk, and especially off the back of a 14-hour flight. I mean, imagine if it were a seven-hour flight, what would we would have gotten? Incredible. Um, Helen, I'm going to turn over to you. Okay, well, um, well, thank you, John, for um, getting me to read this book. When you say you'll be a discussant for a book you haven't yet read, you never know <laughs> what's going on. It might be interesting, but, you know. But I really think this is an important and original and deeply thought-provoking book. And I think it has three particular strengths that are not often found in literature on the regulation of AI. Um, the first one is that literature on um, AI and machine learning is often obscure, at least to someone like me who's not a computer science expert, and this is very clear. Um, the second is that legal writing is often pretty clear, but often extremely dull. Um, and perhaps because Simon is also a novelist, this is very readable and very much alive. Um, and thirdly, um, literature on legal regulation of tech, at least the stuff that I can read, um, is often US and Eurocentric. And because this is written by a Singapore-based lawyer who reads Chinese and can um, analyze and explain the Chinese approach to these issues um, to an Anglophone audience, it's really very um, important. Um, I also like this book be precisely because of its anthropocentric approach. And I think that's reassuring because AI can often feel um, that it's racing away beyond human or normative societal control. I hadn't come across the Elon Musk phrase of immortal dictatorship, but I do remember the, the, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Chris Wiley, was my client. And so I knew um, what had happened with Cambridge Analytica before he um, showed it to the world. And I remember looking and thinking, oh, holy something, I don't know. But um, uh, this is terrifying. And I did stop using the Facebook forthwith. Um, but um, I think this does demonstrate that we we, the humans, can control AI if we decide normatively what it is that we, society, want it to do. And that's the Tim Bernard Lee approach, and it's really important that it feels that you can engage with these things, and if you do engage, you can articulate what it is you want to do, why you want to do it in different spheres, and then you can decide how to do it. Um, so I think that's very uh, reassuring. And I think also it is based um, clearly on the core values which concern me most if I'm looking at the kind of society and world I'd like to live in and I'd like my children to live in and, and, and future generations. Um, I do believe in equal dignity and respect. I'm a kind of post-war rights-based person in that respect. So I want human flourishing on an individual level um, and uh, on a societal level. And in my book, that concerns some sort of positive uh, state or legislative or regulatory action to keep the concept of individual autonomy and power moving forward and living. You, can't, you, you can have individual autonomy and power once, but if you don't have a framework that keeps making sure that that is given back to individuals as perhaps societal structures take it away from them, um, it won't last long. So if you want a, 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 a sort of democratic state where people are given equal respect as a living organism, and importantly, where it... The, um, the, the, the state and individuals are accountable for what goes on, um, then you really do need um, this kind of uh, approach. So um, John and, and Simon have explained uh, that this book really starts by identifying the problems of AI in terms of the speed at which it, wor it, at which it works, uh, the autonomy with which it's capable of working, um, or the autonomy of the robots, that is, um, and uh, the problem of opacity, um, and then looks at utilitarian and moral and um, accountability, legitimacy-based reasons for seeking to overcome those problems. And it looks at the mechanisms which already exist and how those can be used. Ordinary public law concepts, and like duty to give reasons, can be very powerful here, um, as indeed can uh, equality law. Um, but the biggest issue, and the one that I've wrestled with most when I've tried to address um, some of this in some policy-based work I've done, and the one where I think Simon comes up with some really useful um, approaches, is the problem of opacity. Because if, in a sort of traditional um, equality law, um, if somebody puts forward an argument that they've been treated differently from somebody else in an unfair way, you can then look at it and send back to the decision maker, well, can you explain why? this person has been treated more fair, differently from that person. 
And the problem with decisions which are made by um, artificial intelligence are partly that you may never know, you the, the subject of an action may never know why um, you've been treated in a particular way. But more to the point, even if you ask the person who is responsible for the decision-making mechanism, they might not know either. And that um, it's a sort of rubbish in, rubbish out problem. Often AI can reify unfair patterns in society without anyone really grappling with what's happening. Um, so individuals can be unfairly treated based on group predictions, which may um, be based on societal patterns, which we actually wouldn't think were fair if we addressed what was happening. So just the example of the men, men called Jared being best for chief executives or um, prediction mechanisms um, in terms of sentencing where uh, higher scores will be given for recidivism for black men in the criminal justice system, which may, on the current state of society, be true, but it doesn't tell you why. And the big problem is I think we, society, tend, if we don't think about it, to attribute causality to correlation in ways that we just shouldn't do. So I think it, it, it kind of masks things that if we asked individually would be un, un, if we if we were asked individually do you think that's fair we would say no but we look at the pattern and we we feel reassured by it in a, in a false way because it's an, it prevents us from being required to understand and to answer those questions a recent um, local example which much vexed everybody at this university and all around the country in this here last year or the year before I'm losing track um, was was the problem of the off call algorithm that um, decided who was likely to have done well in their A-levels uh, without individuals having a chance to um, succeed. And it was true that people from less successful schools um, might have been less likely to get good A-level results, but you might be the outlier. And it was desperately unfair for you, the individual, never to have had a chance to say, my, my, my social group and my, um, where I'm educated is not my destiny, and you shouldn't. It's just not legitimate to treat me on the basis of a predictive mechanism in that way. And it was interesting that when there was a big social outcry about that, the, the Prime Minister said, oh, it's a mutant algorithm, as if that was something with its own agency and own, you know, the, the naughty algorithm doesn't do it again. You know, we, we do need to be able to say, somebody made up this algorithm, somebody fed in what it thought it should be, um, how it should be deciding, and somebody should be responsible for that. So I do like the fact that this book comes back to that level of human responsibility for setting systems going. And then should there be red lines where you say, well, you can't ever do that. Or if you do, you have to have some human uh, uh, responsibility for reasons of legitimacy um, for doing that. And I like the fact that the book rejects the idea of accountability of algorithms, at least at the moment. I haven't read your once rejected, second time accepted <laughs> article, but I ought to. Um, but I um, was responsible for chairing a working group for the Institute for the Future of Work. Um, we had a report called Mind the Gap about inequality um, and uh, the use of algorithms. And what we suggested there was an Accountability for Algorithms Act. And we thought accountability for algorithms was very important rather than accountability of algorithms, which Im implies that they do have some um, freestanding morality. I also think the book's interesting because it, it recognises that at least since 2016 there's been an enormous plurality of ethical codes and that's great and they often come up with fairly similar principles but who is going to police them and how and by, by what right? You know, why is it legitimate for Facebook to have a code even if it's a marvellous code where it will decide what is and isn't um, appropriate use of uh, technology? Uh, I think it ought, because I'm a Democrat, to, to, to be a state that makes that decision and a state um, that is uh, accountable to its citizens for what it decides the rules um, should be. And then one final observation and just a point that, I, that interests me and, and, and I think some, an area where I'd like there to be more work. Um, the opacity problem means that talk-based problem, talk-based talk models of um, remedy, I suppose, for, for um, algorithms that make decisions that we don't like um, are problematic, um, partly because individuals don't know what's happened to them and partly because even if they do know, they don't know why it's happened and nor may the decision maker. So I'm interested in the suggestions, some of the beginnings of discussions in the book about impact assessments, partly so that those who use algorithms or are responsible for developing them or using them, those who are legally responsible for them, at least need to understand enough 
to be able to explain what they're doing and why, and also so that others can understand that to the extent that they need to, to um, pro 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 properly to be able to uh, enforce uh, uh, responsibility for their use. I think that's important as an aspect of the rule of law. Um, and I am interested in a model that is based on the uh, UK's public sector equality duty, where decision makers, public decision makers, have a duty to think about the equality consequences of things that they do. Just consider it's a duty of, of consideration. Um, as a, and if you don't, and, and that has built in a, a equality as a sort of mandatory relevant consideration for public decision makers. And I think think being able to say we thought about what this was going to do, we thought about why it was doing it, and we went on doing that on an ongoing basis so that the data, as we see more and more about what this, this, this machine is doing, um, or the system is doing, um, we understand it and we are tweaking it with this in mind. I think that's an interesting um, model. But there obviously are a lot, and I, I think it's very interesting for me to test my own thinking against legal systems I know nothing about. So I think it's a great book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. So the second comment will be from Dr. John Zurilli. Okay. So I have a couple of criticisms of this book, but I will limit myself to just one in the allotted five minutes that I have. Um, at the risk of being pedantic, um, I want to put my finger on one particular issue. So my criticism concerns the claim that our existing civil liability regimes might come up short um, against the challenge of AI. So to Chesterman's credit, he does emphasise, and he has today as well, that particularly in the later chapters of the book, I've got to say, um, our current civil liability regimes, he thinks, will, for the most part, um, cover the majority and maybe even the vast majority of um, activities, AI activities in the private sector. Um, that's got to be right. So I was glad that he took pains to say that a number of times. But at the same time, I was slightly surprised by these remarks because when he had the chance to make the case for this in a full-throated and satisfying way, I, I thought that it's as if he wasn't willing to go the whole hog and really um, have the courage of his convictions there. But this could just be my misinterpretation. So, for instance, in Chapter 4, when he's discussing the adequacy of our civil liability regimes, he says, and I quote, the laws of negligence and product liability will resolve many cases of harms caused by autonomous systems, but not all. The speed, autonomy and opacity of AI systems will give rise to accountability gaps. Future cases will arise where there is a harm not attributable to a person or a company. And as an example of this, he gives the death of a child hit by an unidentified drone or killed in error by a lethal autonomous weapon. Um, but in neither of these two cases does it seem to me that we should be in any doubt about the law's resourcefulness to, to deal with these situations. So in the first case, um, the idea of the child being struck by an unidentified drone, well, that seems to be equivalent to a hit and run, a conventional hit and run by a conventional traditional vehicle. And, you know, one where there's no witness around to see what happened and the defendant gets away. That's not a case as I see it, of the law running out um, or of an accountability gap, so much as a case of our not knowing whom the law applies to. Um, and that's not distinctive um, to AI. And in the second case, the idea of someone being killed in error by an, a lethal autonomous weapon. Again, I'm not really convinced that the principles of tort soundly applied would produce accountability gaps or that it makes sense to call them accountability gaps. Um, so, um, obviously, every case is going to come down to its own facts, and sometimes it's trite to say claimants just don't deserve to win, either because they've been negligent themselves and they've sort of set up their own misadventure or, or whatever. But after all is said and done, um, and after all the evidence is in, are we really going to doubt that someone somewhere in the chain of events uh, will be held liable when they really deserve to be through the application of, well, like we had mentioned, product liability principles, vicarious liability, non-delegable duties, apportionment and contribution principles, um, 
the, the maxim res ipsa loquitur, which is just an evidentiary principle that means courts can infer causation in some instances when it's not clear exactly how something causes damage. Uh, and of course, the principles of causation and remoteness of damage. That last principle, remoteness of damage, can do quite a lot of heavy lifting. So people worry that um, machine learning technologies will um, kind of create a deficit in, in liability because these machines learn to do things for themselves, including make mistakes. And so there's this worry that there will be, um, this raises the prospect of a danger inherent in the software for which no one can be held responsible. And Chesterman seems to be worried about this too um, because he does say on numerous occasions that um, the autonomy of an AI system might make the, the, the AI system, as opposed to its manufacturer, responsible for the harm. Uh, but I don't worry about this at all. Um, even the intervening actions of third-party agents don't break the causal nexus between uh, a tort feeser and the claimant's harm, um, so long as the intermediary's intervention, roughly, was of a kind that was reasonably foreseeable. And the word kind there, the kind of damage has to be reasonably foreseeable, is interpreted fairly widely, at least in the UK, at least with respect to physical, personal injury. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, why should it be any different when the intermediary is an artificial agent? So I'll just give you a really quick example. If you're thinking about an autonomous vacuum cleaner, as the programmer, you want it to avoid bumping into objects. So the objective function, the reward function, might be something like avoid um, the, the sensors at the front of the vacuum cleaner coming within a certain proximity of objects. And the system learns to maximise its reward in a very unorthodox way um, by simply travelling backwards. Because there are no sensors at the back, so it's bumping into things left, right and centre, but it's maximising its reward function. Um, now that, to my mind at least, is just the kind of cockamamie thing that could go wrong and that is absolutely within the reasonable foresight of a manufacturer. So um, I don't deny that there will be a need for incremental development um, adjustments here and there that might be required to our civil liability regimes. Um, for example, it, it, it's still unsettled in the UK whether software counts as a service or whether it counts as a product under the Consumer Protection Act. Um, but uh, these are changes one would expect to happen in the ordinary course of legal evolution anyway. It doesn't require AI to bring these to the fore. Um, indeed, they're already in the wings. Um, so I, I know Simon will probably agree with most of the things I've said. So perhaps the difference between us is just one of emphasis or framing. But I couldn't help but think that it's somewhat misleading to talk about there being accountability gaps, which he, he does quite frequently, uh, because that sounds like something portentous and grave, um, when in fact it's just the ordinary life, normal life of the law. There's nothing to see here, in a way. So I'd be keen to hear um, from Simon if he has more specific examples um, of what he thinks would count as worthy of that designation of an accountability gap. Thank you so much to both of our Excellent commentators. So, um, Simon, I think you're within your rights here to just pick and choose those comments that you want to focus on, given, obviously, time constraints. Sure. So, so briefly, maybe three points. Firstly, thank you, both of you, for obviously reading, and, and indeed to you, John, also reading the book so closely uh, and offering generous and critical comments, which I find uh, very helpful. Maybe just, Helen, I'm, I'm prompted by the opacity point that you raised, which I agree is one of the most challenging aspects of um, how uh, AI systems take decisions. The flip side of that, however, is that one of the benefits of AI systems is that if you interrogate them, they will usually try to tell you the truth. And so much as I agree with everything you said about the importance of holding AI to standards and not letting it perpetuate human biases, there is actually a danger uh, that we hold AI to a higher standard than we hold humans. Uh, because if you ask an AI system, okay, did you choose this person to employ because his name was Jared, uh, the AI system will say yes. 
Uh, and if you ask and I said, did you choose this person because it was a white man? It might tell you yes. If you ask a human, did you make this decision because you're racist or sexist? Virtually no human's gonna say yes. Uh, and so there is a danger, uh, I think, that uh, the interrogability of AI systems can pose challenges and that we, much as we should hold AI to a high standard, I'm not sure we should always high, hold it to a higher standard than, than humans. Um, but not, not to really disagree with anything you were saying, but, but I think that is, that is one of the interesting aspects that, that AI presents. On the tort-based um, um, <clears throat> the tort-based responsibility, and this will link in with what John was saying, um, this doesn't just pose challenges in terms of regulation, it poses challenges in terms of practice. So in the medical field, for example, as I, I said, sometimes in medicine we don't care how a pharmaceutical works, but the whole medical legal regime is premised on doctor-patient relationship and patient autonomy. And if the, if the doctor doesn't understand how a, how a process works, how a procedure works, uh, then how is, how, are he or she, how is he or she going to explain it to a patient and how is a patient going to take a decision? Uh, and there are really interesting discussions. It, it's kind of shocking, but still, that as, um, as John said, it's not clear whether software is a product for the purposes of product liability law. It's not clear in most jurisdictions whether reliance upon an AI system is a procedure for the purposes of medicine. Uh, it's basically, it's the equivalent of a doctor Googling something uh, on the internet, if a, if a doctor feeds information into an AI system and gets a response, that's treated very much the same. Uh, it's treated like an individual research, and then the doctor is responsible. But if the doctor doesn't understand it, it makes it impossible for him or her to do his or her job um, effectively, or at least in the traditional legal model. Um, and John, thank you very much for the, the detailed analysis. I, I suppose what I was really getting at is the thought experiment, which, uh, I mean, I agree for present purposes at the moment, if an unidentified drone injured someone, yes, it would be ultimately attributable. But project forward five, 10 years from now, uh, and unless we sort of act to impose limits on what's possible to, just to create, AI systems can create other AI systems. And that's the kind of uh, causation link breaking um, uh, chain of events that I'm concerned about, that eventually you will have AI systems where it's not immediately obvious. I mean, traditionally, you can hold either the owner, the operator, or the manufacturer responsible. Um, but if the manufacturer um, cannot reasonably be held because of a chain of events, the owner can't be identified or doesn't exist because uh, the machine's gone rogue, uh, and there is no user, uh, I think it's not inconceivable in the very near future uh, that we have situations where it's not quite like a hit and run situation where we kind of know what happened, and indeed, we've got an insurance regime in many jurisdictions that's premised on the possibility of that happening to, come to compensate. Um, the first thing I think we need is limits to ensure that we don't have this sort of runaway um, um, system that gets beyond human control uh, and that you can always attribute, as you were saying we should, we, you, you, we basically maintain that uh, ability to attribute activity and in particular harms back to traditional actors, uh, but also an insurance regime uh, that can compensate losses where that's not possible, either because of practical difficulties, which, as you point out, can happen under the current law, uh, or the kind of near-term scenario where, I, I, mean, I think there, there are people who are arguing much more strongly than I that basically AI is going to run amok. Uh, I don't hold to that view, but I'm not as sort of optimistic that the current situation will maintain uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, unless we act to prevent it sort of getting out of our hands. Sure. Because um, th that question of civil liability, I mean, I, 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 I come to this because I'm really concerned about the creation of system, systematic injustice, and that can be by the state, so things like um, sentencing, sent, you know, predictive um, sentencing software that look, predicts risks of recidivism, can't say it, um, but also in the private sector. And because I think that the, we, the humans, need to be able to say what we think is unfair. And I start from the presumption that fairness should, should be, depending on your, your, your actual attributes, your actual characteristics. And if you have a, 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 a it's partly a speed problem, that if um, you advertise a job and then you say, we are only going to um, give it to people with certain characteristics, then you can interrogate whether those are reasonable characteristics. But if you have 
um, as is widely, widely used in the private sector, software that will decide who sees an advertisement for a job. And who knows, it's decided that more people who read um, Car Weekly than Vogue are interested in this job. More people who like, who, who respond and say this is their favourite colour rather than that is their favourite colour. All sorts of data points that may be proxies for gender or class or, or, or race, but we don't know what they are. There are so many correlations that we can't examine them. And so we can't begin to say, is that fair? And we are reifying patterns of disadvantage in a way that we just can't interrogate. And that seems to me unjust in a way that no one will ever know they're the victim and no one supposedly accountable unless they're required to examine why are we, why is this software throwing up? These are the people I ought to interview. Um, we'll, we'll know either. And I think that's a really important social problem if, if we want to keep equality of dignity and respect. John, do you want to come back? Mm. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the worry that you, you outlined, what you were really getting at with the sort of um, downstream effects of unpredictable AIs generating other AIs and so on that might break the causal nexus. I'm just So the first thing that comes to mind there is isn't that very sort of causal sequence the kind of thing that you then sort of come to expect as par for the course when you're dealing with highly technical and advanced systems? In which, case, in which case, it strikes me that it won't escape the clutches of principles of remoteness, um, depending on, of course, how stereotyped these causal sequences are. But, I mean, it seems like there's a restricted category of causal sequences that we're bound to see, and eventually they'll all just be par for the course. That's, that's sort of the first thing that popped in my mind, but um, I'm not sure. Um, in relation to your point, mm. Helen, I was wondering whether these concerns you've had about not knowing why you're receiving a particular ad, is your concern here that there um, is some sort of a, a tort going on, that some sort of a civil wrong is occurring, or is it purely grounded in fairness and justice? Well, well, yes, because the the um, if I'm a user of Facebook um, and it's not giving me the fair a, a, an equal chance with somebody who might be who is on any I, I think you know, just view as as qualified as me to see a job in the first place. I'll never know that's happening, um, but I'm yeah I'm being discriminated against as a service user. So yes, there is a, a, a legal wrong as well as a moral wrong, but what, not one that you can ever identify. Unless, unless you're, you're, you, the, the person who's using whatever hiring tool it is, is looking and saying, how come um, everyone I'm getting for this job is um, called Jared or yeah, male? Yeah. You know, and, and then you could, and th but then you can go back and you can say, well, is the reason that the people I'm getting for this um, professor of computer science job um, are all white men because let's look at the people who have a degree. Where, where in the system is the problem? It's not my problem. I'm just hiring fairly the people with the, the right qualification. Is that the right qualification for me to ask for? But because they are so obscure even to the people who use them, these hiring mechanisms, and, they, and, they, and they're not causally saying, we think we, you should have at least a good 2-1 from here. They're just finding patterns in the data um, in ways that are just correlations and machines finding that humans might not find. And they might be things that are based on deep societal patterns, but not necessarily we ones want to reproduce yeah. and, and more to point, speed up and, and, and harden. So that, that's why I think it matters. Of course, there's human prejudice too, and, and Helen Margetz always says to me, don't, don't, um, you know, don't go dewey-eyed about human decision-making. That's not necessarily fair either. Yeah. <laughs> machines, yeah. machines have the ability to, to, to identify patterns and then improve, you know, take out bugs that you don't want. But, but I just think we need to address it because I don't think it's straightforward that a tort model mm. works for that kind of problem. Yeah. So, sorry if there's anyone out there called Jared. Don't, <laughs> don't feel unduly put upon. Uh, may, maybe just one last comment on this and we might open it up more broadly. It's, uh, I think maybe the civil regime is a little bit easier maybe to attribute responsibility more broadly. It becomes more of a challenge in the criminal regime and, and maybe the area in which this has been most discussed is in the context of potential war crimes. Uh, and here, one of the challenges, if you deploy a lethal autonomous weapon, um, who's, who's going to be held criminally responsible? And that's a lot harder to attribute. And the, the likely scenario, if we can't get them banned completely, and I fear that ship might have sailed because um, there's a UN report saying that an autonomous drone was uh, deployed in the Libyan conflict in 2020. There are stories about uh, what the Russians are deploying in Ukraine right now. Um, 
the, there are sort of a couple of possibilities. Is, is it fair to put the commander in the field, uh, hold him or her as responsible? Uh, if the AI system, if an autonomous drone is given to them as a black box, is that really fair? Do you put it upstream to the, uh, the commander who deploys the weapon in the first place? Or is it the person who designed the weapon? Um, and that, that is, I think, going to get a little bit more challenging in the near future. To me, the simplest thing is ban these things completely, but uh, I think that's going to be very, very difficult because there tends to be an inverse relationship between the countries with the most advanced weaponry and their willingness to ban those weapons because at the moment they think there's an advantage to be had. Excellent. So I'm going to turn over to our... Yes, Karina. Thank you very much. This was a very stimulating talk and discussion. Uh, so my question is also on the accountability gap, and uh, I'm taking accountability here to maybe be akin to blame or a DMS. Um, so I wonder, it seems that we already have these gaps occurring. So I'm thinking of, let's say, medication or the pharmaceutical industry, where we have certain very strict procedural rules and regulations about how medication is being tested, and then it comes to the market, and there is a list of all the side effects. And then people can come to harm if they experience one of the side effects. Uh, but there is nobody who is strictly accountable in this sense. Yes, the company is responsible, but if they uh, fulfilled all the requirements, there does seem to be something like an accountability gap. Um, similarly, in public transport, let's say, uh, there's uh, certain regulations and like, they're all fulfilled, and then we have a one-in-a-lifetime um, snowstorm and uh, people come to harm. It seems, again, there seems to be an accountability gap. So I was wondering, A, whether you think... Uh, a, why you think this is different from, let's say, the autonomous system case in the, in, in the, technology, in the technology realm, and B, whether you think, um, wait, I think I might have, right, whether you think there are, where there are areas where this approach could not work, just having very strict procedural requirements and then have a risk-based approach that says, you know, I mean, certain risks are acceptable and um, we have taken them and we're, we're also, you know, taking the sting out of the accountability gap by just accepting it in some cases. Yeah, so I mean, I'd, I'd kind of push back against the premise that, that all harms are bad. Now, you didn't put it quite like that, but accountability to me means the ability to hold someone or something to account. It doesn't mean to avoid all harms, and you didn't put it that extreme, but I'm, I'm reminded, I was once on a on a committee in Singapore because there was a, a breach of a data security regime and they said, okay, the, you, our task is to maintain data security. I said, that's our only term of reference? Yes, data security, okay. Turn off all the computers, lock them in a safe. Mm -hmm. Now that's not what you want. You, what you want is to manage risks. So I think where you ended up uh, is precisely the focus. How do we manage risks? Uh, and part of that is through accountability. Uh, and so our discussion about torts is partly uh, about holding individuals responsible, like transferring loss, so the loss, uh, not all losses are going to get compensated. Some losses we just accept. So your example of pharmaceuticals, I mean, some people get sick, some people die. Um, transportation kills, a million people a year die in traffic accidents, uh, and often there's compensation, but not adequate to deal with the, the loss of life. So we're prepared to accept all sorts of consequences as a society. Um, I mean, just the risk-based assessment of where, whether we're wearing masks. I mean, I'm coming from Singapore where we'd all be going to prison. Uh, well, not, that's probably a bit extreme, but uh, we would be in violation of various uh, COVID protocols because we've got different risk assessments. Um, so I think the, the strong arm of the law is only part of this. And so tort-based accountability. So there's, there's, if you like, there's criminal law to impose hard penalties where we want to draw clear moral lines with hard penalties to enforce them. Tort is about shifting of liability, but also regulating in a softer sense. So tort, the idea of a tort is you compensate for loss, but you also deter others from engaging in behavior that will be um, unnecessarily risky or might lead to unjust harms in, in other circumstances because you don't want to have to litigate every single time. But the risk assessment also offers other possibilities. And this is something that Helen touched on in her commentary um, that I think are really interesting in the context of AI because the law will apply to most circumstances most of the time. We can quibble about how often. But I think there are other regulatory tools that are really interesting. Uh, and I think of these as the sort of before, during, and after. The before is this sort of idea of impact assessments. Uh, that before we deploy new systems that might affect rights, responsibilities, um, uh, and so on, 
uh, that we want to do an assessment so that we go in with our eyes open. This idea of a kind of deliberation, I think, is very important. And the, the greater the potential risk, the more elaborate the deliberation should be. So that's the impact assessment. Um, in terms of the, the sort of during or the, the middle period, um, I have this idea, well, not original to me, so I didn't come up with the idea of an ombudsperson, um, but the ombudsperson type um, uh, institution, I think, is a really interesting one where you can have someone whose mandate is not to enforce a law, but to look for problems, to look for gaps. Uh, and, and that idea of the ombudsperson institution, which has its origins in Scandinavia, I think is a really interesting sort of regulatory gap filler, uh, which is what we're going to see in the context of AI. And then the after period is, uh, this is, again, one of the benefits of AI, is the possibility of audits. So one thing that I think is enormously important, uh, and it will address, it will help address most AI problems, uh, is um, just keeping a trail. Uh, and AI systems are usually quite good at that. Uh, they'll keep lots of data, uh, and so in the event that there is a harm, you can then go back and try and work out, okay, is it possible to attribute, or at least is it possible to learn from this? Um, but on, on the key question of accountability being the same as blameworthiness, which I think where you started off, um, I'd want to distinguish those two, because accountability doesn't always mean you get someone to blame. Uh, and not every harm leads to compensation because as a society, sometimes we just have to accept that bad things happen uh, or that we go into situations where we let bad things happen, we should at least do that with our eyes open. So this has prompted a lively discussion online. So perhaps keep the, some of the answers more succinct so we can get through them. So one is uh, Richard Reinhold says, I would be interested to hear more about exclusion of military applications. And on a related theme, Jessica asks, should we aim for a global governance with respect to autonomous weapons? You've indicated some skepticism. So do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, I, I, would, I would love it if we could, but um, I don't think it's realistic. The, and, and this goes to the general sort of levels of governance um, that I think, as we've been emphasizing, the most important, the most powerful institution is going to remain the state. Uh, when it comes to the kind of regulatory hammer, uh, you have to rely on states. There will be a lot of self-regulation. Industry standards probably are the most um, sort of consumer-facing. Uh, and we've seen that in data protection where companies internalize sort of the, the market for privacy has changed just in the last few years. Uh, and so there's a possibility of that as well. The international level, I mean, I'm an international lawyer. I have worked for the United Nations. I'm a big supporter of the United Nations. The last thing the UN should be doing is running the internet or controlling AI uh, because it would be a lowest common denominator regime. Uh, and so, um, yes, I would, I would be a big fan of global regulation of AI systems. I actually advocate for one red line, just that autonomous systems should, make, should not make individualized targeting decisions, uh, but there's just no international agreement on that, so I'm not holding my breath. Thank you. Yeah, no, I thought, e excellent discussion, and thank you so much for that. And, and I'm kind of encouraged to hear that there's something of a consensus that we've got a ton of law, and a lot of it just needs to be marshaled and brought to bear on this new technology. We're going to do Lots and lots of new, new law, and so I would be interested in your notion about what about the new uh, um, AI uh, uh, regulation that has been drafted. It seems to be capable of outlawing almost anything that's a universal Turing machine, which is almost anything you can compete with. So I, I, I'm uncomfortable with, with, with how that's being thought of. So, so more more thoughts on why more law of that sort, and it may be to do with those comments. Or I think many touched on it already. The other thing that interests me is one class of um, challenge that's increasingly coming through in AI systems is the question of provenance. And it is the whole issue of deep fakes. It's the notion of, is a thing what it uh, claims to be? And that notion of authenticity, uh, and, and do we have a, a, a good canon of law to deal with that? Uh, where, again, think of FTC, uh, unfair and discriminatory practices, there is, there is quite a, a lot. But I mean, um, is there anything in particular about what we should be thinking around uh, the ability of these systems to be deeply descending, and contrary to the notion that they often, you know, they don't have to be uh, uh, truthful in that sense. So if you don't mind, just take one more, mm -hmm. so Mike. Yeah, so this is, this is about the lethal autonomous weapons. I, I had a few questions, but this seems the most pertinent. Um, so I, I need brilliant philosophers and lawyers to answer the following question for me, which has been troubling me for a while. Um, so the scenario that, we, you, that you described, that, that lethal autonomous weapon makes the wrong targeting decision and kills the child. And I'm pretty sure that we'd all agree that's horrific and we don't want that. And I'm personally strongly against lethal autonomous weapons. 
So let me give you another scenario. A B-52 is flying seven miles up, um, and it's targeting some site, maybe this is 1967, and it's flying over Laos, and uh, the bombardier sights its target, suspected Viet Cong base or whatever it is, opens the bomb doors and presses release, and 30 tons of bombs are released. There's a huge amount of uncertainty about where those bombs are going to land, and the bombardier doesn't know who they're going to kill. So the bombs drop, and a child gets killed. We don't see the same revulsion, for, I mean, we don't like that, but we don't see the same horror for that act as we do for lethal autonomous weapons. Why are we not appalled in the same way of killing people at random, which is what you're doing if you're flying six miles over somewhere and dropping bombs, um, uh, to uh, deploying lethal autonomous weapons that simply have that decision? Why? They seem to be in the same moral category for me. Um, so why, why, why are we having this sort of this, this debate now about lethal autonomous weapons? Why is it different? So maybe you go backwards, just dealing with it. It's a complex question, but this is um, bedeviled countries that have developed more sophisticated military tools and then complain, why are we held to a higher standard? Because we've got a laser guide of munition which shows, which has a camera showing where it's going to hit, uh, and they are held to a higher standard. Uh, than someone who's dropping bombs out of the back of a B-52. Um, because that's how technology develops, that's how military standards, it's how reasonableness uh, develops. Uh, and in terms of the law, the, um, the, the starting point is, okay, the, the principles of the laws of war are, are geared basically to two basic, uh, two simple ideas. Um, distinguishing between military and civilian and minimizing unnecessary harm, or unnecessary suffering. Uh, and so in your example of the child, as long as it was a military target, and as long as it was a kind of reasonable decision by the case, uh, by the by the bombardier, then he or she has not committed a, a war crime, um, and so that that's the kind of the, the criminal element. Morally, yeah, I think that is a huge challenge. I mean, and our, you, you could add a racial dimension. Why are we more concerned about a Laotian, less concerned about a child in Laos than than Ukrainian children who happen to be on the front page of the New York Times today? Uh, that, that's a whole separate question. But I think what, what really comes down to it is the individualized decision making. Uh, and that if it was, if you had a soldier who had made an erroneous, I mean, it looked, the child looked like uh, an adult holding an AK 47 uh, and the shot was fired, uh, and then the conclusion was no, that was a completely unreasonable decision, then you would hold the soldier accountable. Uh, I think what morally uh, affronts many of us is this idea that an, a synthetic entity that we have created, we're responsible for ultimately, is making this individualized decision um, and then choosing to kill a child. There's an element in which it's like a serial killer who does something wicked and evil, uh, but it's one step removed from humanity. I think that's why many of us have this sort of visceral sort of reaction to the idea of kind of that, that, that AI system. So I have the same reaction, but nevertheless, I think our thinking on this and our moral outrage is a bit confused if we're prepared to accept one not the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, your very interesting question, just having the, the, the idea of uh, reinventing the wheel reminded me, because since I mentioned I once worked briefly for the UN, there's a saying within the UN that no wheel shall go unreinvented. <laughs> um, but on, on the, so briefly. Sounds like academia, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Actually, I was, I was once asked um, the old joke um, how many Oxford dons does it take to change a light bulb? Change? <laughs> um, <clears throat> So the EU Act, I think, is a, is a kind of grab bag, and it's, it, it was an effort to plant a marker um, to say we hold certain values. They've been sort of gazumped to some extent by Brazil and China now also adopting laws. Um, but it's, it's a first draft, uh, and I think one advantage the EU has is that its processes tend to be quite slow and deliberative, back to this idea of deliberation. Uh, but, yeah, the idea that you define AI so... Do you, be, do you want to be over-inclusive or under-inclusive? And I would focus on the specific narrow things that we want to prohibit rather than a grab bag that is unenforceable. Um, you've had other efforts like UNESCO adopted this, uh, this wonderfully, wonderful set of motherhood statements that no one could disagree with. China signed on to something that says that you should have, not have any kind of social credit scoring or real-time biometric surveillance, which they do on a daily basis. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, on the question of provenance, this, this ability to dissemble is, uh, I, I mean, I was saying earlier that AI systems try to tell the truth. There are some experiments now where AI systems learn to cheat. Uh, and so that is a problem. 
But there's also a human problem, uh, and I know some of you are tweeting away. Uh, there's a real problem that humans also like fake news. Uh, all sorts of experiments show that um, false information spreads much more quickly uh, and is consumed much more voraciously than accurate information because accuracy is boring. Uh, so this is not something that's limited to the machines, but, uh, but the ability to engage in sophisticated, deceptive practices is, is going to be a huge challenge because... Do we, have, do we have law sufficient for that? I mean, that's, uh... No, so, okay, so Singapore had a, has an extreme version of this. Singapore, we have a Prevention of Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act. Uh, which empowers each government minister uh, to determine what is true or false. Uh, and so if you post something that is factual, so there's a distinction between opinion and facts, and philosophers can quibble about that. But if you say the government deficit is this and it's actually that, uh, you can be required to take it down. Uh, or Facebook is, can be required to put up a note saying this, is, uh, this has been um, identified as false and click this link to find the truth, or some variation on that. Uh, so the regulatory environment is, is a challenge because obviously that runs the risk of chilling uh, free speech. Uh, and where does satire fit in all of this? There are all sorts of things that are false but funny. Do we want to stop that going online? Uh, so I think this, this is a real challenge, but it's not limited to the machines. Uh, it's, it, it also affects the way in which we consume information at a time when around the world so many people have decided that they've got their own truths or they want to do their own research. Uh, I think the, the, the respect for an authoritative source, single source of truth has long gone, uh, and the machines are only a subset of the challenge that that poses. So there's another question um, from our online audience. Uh, George Evangelinos asks, do we need a form of universal declaration of human rights for legislating AI? I mean, that's a, a broad question. Some might have the more specific question, do we need new human rights for the era of AI? So. Arguably, you're arguing for one. You're saying there's a right to a human decision in certain domains, and that chimes with some of the, um, some of the EU's thinking um, in the GDPR, for example. So what do you think about the human rights dimension? So, I mean, there's a lively debate online whether robots should have rights. And I, I'm, there's a colleague who's um, done this sort of matrix of whether they can or can't have rights, whether they should or shouldn't. And I'm in the, yeah, they could, but they shouldn't. Um, and the problem with that is it really relies ultimately on a kind of speciesism. If, again, if we project forward to um, empathetic robots, social robots that look and act human, engage, become caregivers, um, the only distinction we can make between us and them is that we are natural persons. Uh, we don't have to justify our humanity. Mo there's no serious legal regime that doesn't give full personality to um, at least adult humans that are not incarcerated and of sound mind. Um, but to what extent do we need to add to that? Um, yeah, I would, I, I would limit it to um, the ability to understand, um, to, to attribute, well, to maintain control over AI systems and to understand them to the minimal degree necessary. This is not the same as saying, as I think the EU Act does, that you should always know when you're dealing with an AI system. I think that's an easy thing to say, but a very hard thing to implement. So, I mean, intuitively, most of us would like to know, am I talking to a human or an AI system? But in practice, I mean, if you're engaging in, if, if you engage with chatbots, um, you don't know. Uh, and most sophisticated chatbots now have a degree of automation, and then when it's a, it's a challenging question, it goes up to a human, um, but it's not always clear when you're dealing with uh, a human. Or even if you are dealing with a human, if you call a call center, um, all they're doing is reading off a computer screen. So yes, you're dealing with a human. The human's not taking any decisions, though. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would stick to uh, we need to maintain control of these systems and have a basic degree of understanding of them. Can I ask you about um, your tripartite scheme? So the third part is legitimacy, and that has this intriguing idea that there are certain decisions that are the exercise of an inherently governmental function and they should never be outsourced to an automated system. And you say because they are, um, the point is not because they are correct, these decisions made by humans, but because they are capable of being held to account through a political or other process. So it's a kind of process legitimacy point. So this seems quite, quite a powerful claim. Um, so I wondered if I could ask you a tripartite question in response to your tripartite Get scheme. So one thought would be, sure, the process is part of legitimacy, but so is outcomes. 
And if it turns out that this automated system systematically delivers far superior outcomes in terms of decision, why wouldn't we trade off our process concerns about legitimacy in order to derive the better outcomes? And it's making it look as though you're giving this kind of absolute priority to process. Think about people like Sunstein and others who say, look, legal decision making is all over the place depending on the time of day, depending on what they had for breakfast, depending if their football team won. Well, if you could iron out that massive noise that they purport to find, wouldn't that be something you'd need to weigh against your process concern, assuming it's legitimate? And might there be cases where it's simply, so it becomes a vanishingly small and perhaps sort of non-existent domain, the domain you're talking about. Second question one might have is, um, when the automated system takes this decision, there's a prior decision by humans to implement that decision. So the accountability falls there. That would be John's kind of point, that you don't just look at the proximate decision maker, you look at the background decision maker. So there is still democratic accountability. Someone decided that it's appropriate to deploy an automated system here. The third question is this. You often talk about shared values, but and then you also acknowledge we live in a world where they're not necessarily um, to be had. Do you think there can be legitimate cultural variation with respect to that question? So, for example, you know, one is given to understand that the Chinese are very enthusiastic about automating their legal system. But they might not, for various cultural reasons, have the same sensitivity and same emphasis on process legitimacy as you do, for example. So to what extent are you operating here within a common law or Western framework? And so therefore the Chinese might be getting something wrong in this respect, or should we just say, actually, there's gonna be an enormous scope here for cultural variation? Thanks, John. Um, so we've got another hour or so, do we? I'm, <laughs> um, no, I, I'll be, I'll I'm be only brief. thinking about your long flight, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so really fascinating questions. On the, on the process legitimacy, uh, I mean, what I'm partly talking about is there's a nice line, I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said of the US Supreme Court uh, that we're not, uh, we're not final because we're infallible, we're infallible because we're final, mm -hmm. uh, which means that they're not perfect decision makers, but you need some kind of final decision making. So on your, on your first question, um, to what extent should we just accept, well, if the computers make better decisions than the rest of us, should we just hand over control? In some areas, yeah. Um, transportation, give it to the computers. Um, dispensation of justice, determination of um, uh, the, the rights and wrongs of individuals, implementation of the criminal law, imposition of sentencing, no. Um, because computers are very good at optimizing. AI systems are great at optimizing, at classification, uh, and coming up with optimal outcomes. But the function of a society is not optimization, I would at least argue. Some people would argue that, that yeah, the, the purpose of government is to facilitate a market economy full stop. I think that's a very narrow view of government. And of a legal system in particular, um, the problem with going down that path is that, um, and this is now maybe worth pausing to talk about what AI systems actually do, what machine learning actually does. It's essentially, a, a, the computer scientists can correct me, it's a very sophisticated form of statistics. It's regression analyses, it's um, uh, establishing correlations uh, and making predictions based on past behavior. AI systems are very good at this. Mm -hmm. So in a legal system, you can do this. You can say, feed in all the evidence uh, and then the just outcome based on all the other decisions is this. And even if an AI system was better at that than a judge, I still don't think you should hand it over to the AI system because the it's a fundamentally different view of what the law is. Uh, law is not just optimization. If it were, I mean, law, law is not weather prediction because that's really what AI systems are doing in this context. Uh, and so if you wanted to predict the legal outcome based on all the conflagration of circumstances, uh, then the AI system could do it in the same way that we can predict what the weather is. But that would also then fix us because law, in that case, would become a backward-looking enterprise rather than a forward-looking enterprise. So if you'd done this, if we had this technology 100 years ago, uh, we would not have civil rights. We would not have um, the developments in, um, in liberty that we've had subsequently um, because those are 
human political struggles that we've fought for and fought over. So long way of saying that I don't think merely regard, I, so there are some areas that optimization is the right approach, but I would argue that many others uh, uh, that are that not. One, you could, couldn't you say that you could deploy these um, automated systems for a large number of cases, deal with them, whilst also having in parallel humans, and in that way, you, you're not static. So this, this is linked with your second idea of implementation. There's, this is the sort of get out of jail card that people deploy that say, as long as there's a human saying yes or no, as long as the human is in the loop, uh, then we're okay. The problem there is human psychology and automation bias. That um, once you, if you had the sort of humans, and this is, I'll get to China in a second, once you have the human being given, okay, this is the recommended outcome, um, and then you just click yes, uh, the human becomes a default, the human becomes a rubber stamp. And so the EU tried to address this in the general data protection regulation by saying there must be meaningful human engagement. It can't just be the human ticking a box or clicking yes. Uh, because if we limit human involvement to implementation uh, and back to lethal autonomous weapons, at the moment the line is uh, you would have, and it's not just AI systems, you've had consulting companies, private military security companies doing this, the inherently governmental function in the, in the US context, for example, with the drones, is okay, you have a company that builds the drones, equips the drones, prepares the drones, flies the drones, comes up with targeting recommendations, and then you have someone in uniform who has to say yes or no. Uh, and the problem is, all the interesting questions have already been taken, uh, and if the only thing is yes or no, uh, then, uh, then all too often the person will just say yes. China and the, the cultural variation. Yes, you will have very different attitudes. Um, and, I mean, China is a, an endlessly fascinating and complex country. I mean, I've lived there for a year. I don't presume to understand it completely. Uh, but one very big difference is that the rule of law in China does not mean, uh, I mean, the, the Supreme People's Court exists, but it is below the Communist Party. Uh, and it operates in service of the Communist Party. And it's, it's highly debatable. It's a rule of law country. Probably rule by law is a better description. Uh, that it is organized power, uh, deployed in an accountable way, but not in a manner that puts the rule of law above political institutions, but they rather operate in service of political institutions. And I think that instrumental approach to the rule of law is one reason why, uh, combined with the technological sophistication of the companies in China, uh, that China has been experimenting with these really interesting examples of um, predictive uh, uh, decision making for judges, uh, one click sentencing in some courts. We're not completely isolated from that in Western countries, uh, so dispute settlement uh, is probably the most um, common thing that many of you might have experienced. If you get into a dispute on eBay, eBay famously resolves 60 million disputes, that, that figure's now a bit out of date, uh, every year without a human involved. Uh, and so AI system can be quite good at mediation, at, um, uh, at, at coming up with suggested ways of resolving disputes. But that's quite different from the fundamental questions of justice that I think ultimately come to the highest courts. And those questions only come up partly if you have a structure that feeds those decisions up in a human decision-making chain. If we start handing over too many of those decisions, we won't just be handing over the legal disputes, we'll be handing over huge chunks of politics of the, the very idea of what makes a just society. Uh, and sort of last thing maybe on this in the area of ethics, the idea that you could outsource ethics. I mean, this is the sort of ethics as a service phenomenon. I mean, ethics, we haven't solved the problems of ethics not because we're stupid. Uh, and if only there was a clever moral philosopher, he or she would answer all of the questions of ethics. And that seems to be the idea that if we just had a smart enough computer, we could solve ethical problems. The reason we can't solve ethical problems is because they're not soluble, because they're meant to be fought over, they're meant to be debated over, uh, and we wouldn't be humans if we didn't keep debating them. Great. It, it sounds to me a little bit, though, that the defense of the inherently governmental decisions is starting to look a bit um, in terms of the consequences, rather than that it's inherently problematic, but rather if we outsource these decisions, then it would have these further consequences. But I think we can discuss this a bit later. If you can go on for five more minutes, are you happy to do that? Yeah, you're the one who I, did I, the long flight. I, I, I flew here for this discussion. Right, so. okay, so then there are three questions I want to take together. If we can reduce them to very short questions. They are Milo, Grant, and Alain. So and short Milo. answers, you're saying, as well. Yes. Okay, great, so you have this idea about automation bias and humans being in the loop in a problematic way. Uh, because humans come in later, and this could be the issue of autonomous weapons. 
But why can't they just come in earlier? Why can't the human decision be conditional? If such and such conditions are met, drop the bomb. So think about a tripwire. You put in a tripwire, if someone crosses the tripwire, a bomb explodes. Just do the same thing with an AI system. Except the AI system is much better at identifying whether the tripwire has been crossed by friend or foe. Admirably succinct. Um, Grant. So I just wanted to, um, you know, interested in the discussion about legal decision making. I just wanted to press on something like, depending that there might be some decisions that you might want to defer. Like, think of the question of giving parole to someone who's a convicted sex offender and whether they represent a danger to the public or not. And let's say we have a black box, which turns out extremely good at predicting um, the recidivism of those um, offenders as against a parallel system that we're running where we just make human decisions. Um, I mean, that seems to be a context where I'm not sure what we should do, but it does seem to be quite pressing to say, we know there'll be many more victims if we don't adopt the um, black box, but we're happy to, you know, we're happy to accept that. Perhaps not happy. But well, sorry, we're willing to accept that. Sorry. I want to question the premise of your reasoning, which is about um, your creativity. And you say AI is always backward looking, it's only repeated in the past, it's projecting projecting it into the future. I, I'm not sure that's true, actually. I think there are people in AI who think that you know human creativity is nothing special. It's a recombination of past data. And soon enough, already actually, AI has been able to produce new art, new ideas, based on you know the combinatorially exclusive number of, of already existing data and ideas. So I'm not sure that's true, and that might have implications. That has implications in particular for the claim that, well, you know, for, for the law, you know, because of this creative dimension, we can't outsource it to AI. I, I'm not so sure. Over to you. Okay, three excellent questions. So, uh, Milo, Milo, is it? Um, so, there are all sorts of automated systems in conflict. So, landmines are, in a sense, automated um, heat seeking missiles, uh, automated um, close in weapon systems, uh, automated. Um, so you were saying, so how, why don't we get the human uh, involved earlier? Obviously we can. Um, the question, I suppose, is how much responsibility he or she can then take. Uh, because if, it's a, if it is a sort of simple sort of question, okay, in these circumstances do this, I mean, that's kind of what military discipline is intended to do for, for lower-ranking soldiers not to be taking individualised decisions. You want them to react very quickly according to training. You want to train people. Uh, and that's one of the attractions for autonomous weapons, because you can train them. Uh, and indeed, one of the arguments in favor of lethal autonomous weapons is that most war crimes happen because soldiers get angry, they're racist, they're sexist, they do stupid things. Uh, and our system won't do those things, you hope. Um, the problem is that idea of grappling with the, the moral responsibility. So if, if it's meaningful human decision-making, then I'm all for it. My concern is that to the extent that you allow it to become... Um, at the moment, there's already a problem with drone warfare. The reason drones became so popular for the United States in particular is it reduced the cost of conflict because no one's getting shot down. I mean, if, you, if the hardware gets shot down, fine. But that means that the decision-making is happening in uh, Nevada by some guy who then goes home to his um, uh, family and has no sort of moral investment in the battle. Uh, and that's really caused some um, law of war experts to worry that people are becoming psychologically distant. The problem with you deploying um, autonomous weapons is that you become morally distant as well because people are increasingly removed from that decision making. And that's my concern. But if you can have meaningful human involvement, and that's the language the ICRC uses, I'm all for it. Um, Grant on um, the kind of ends justifying the means. Um, so this is where I, I would differ. I mean, as we were saying earlier, in the context of employment, I think it's more intuitive that it's unfair to um, let correlation, uh, like all these Jareds get jobs uh, and, um, and Janets don't. Um, in the criminal law context, I would say, I mean, there's a kind of Kantian response that you, you would be proposing to treat humans as ends, as means rather than ends, um, that rather that say, look, the computer says statistically you're likely to reoffend. Therefore, we're not going to take that risk. Uh, and I think if we put ourselves in the position of being on the receiving end of that judgment, being told about your statistical um, chances of success, uh, we do something about it when it's the academic results of students 
Uh, and I would hope we would do something when it's the rights of, of prisoners who remain sort of humans, as horrible as some of the things that they've done might be. Um, but yeah, I would, I would push back against that kind of uh, approach. Uh, and on creativity, yes, I mean, I was, okay, I'm not a technical expert on AI. I was talking mainly about the kind of, um, uh, the categorization and, uh, and um, um, correlation models that are used in AI decision-making machine learning systems that are meant to sort of help make these predictions based on past outcomes. AI systems are very good at creating new things. Uh, and this is what um, uh, Ryan Abbott, a colleague, of, or a friend of mine, uh, Surrey has been going around the world trying to win lawsuits by saying, my AI system, Dabus, has created something. And as I said in the presentation, that was rejected here, although Britain does have computer-assisted learning in copyright context, uh, computer-assisted uh, creation in copyright. Many other jurisdictions do not. There's no doubt that AI can create new things. Is that the same as a human creating something? Um, I would say at the moment, at least, no. Um, that the reason, I mean, John, very kind, you can buy my books, my novels online, the only things my children uh, uh, that I've written, uh, the only thing my children have read. The experience of creating something like that uh, for a human still is quite different from an AI system. So you're absolutely right that AI can create new things, um, but that act of creation, I still would argue, is very different from uh, the human act of creation partly because of the motive, and this is where copyright law at the moment limits protection uh, for autonomously or, or computer-generated um, uh, items, even in the United Kingdom. I think moral rights don't go with creation, uh, that are the creations that are attributed to machines. So yes, we will continue to see enormously interesting things created by AI, uh, but I hope at least we will still incentivize and reward human creators uh, because the AI systems will keep creating things as long as they have a power source, uh, whereas humans do need more reward and, and recognition, I think. Well, I think we need to draw to a close there. So thank you to everyone in the room. Thank you to everyone watching online for attending this talk. This has been one of the liveliest discussions we've ever had, Simon, so that's no doubt down to you and your excellent book. So thank you to you and to our two excellent commentators. Can we thank them, please? And thank you.